Well, it's hard, hard for me to believe that we're at episode number 147 already. Amazing. Some brilliant, brilliant artists that we've talked to over 147 episodes. And this week, we're going to be talking to the world's leading expert on Vincent van Gogh. His name is Theo Maidendorp, and he's at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And I met him a few years ago. I asked him to be on the show, and I learned a few things even today that I never knew about Van Gogh, including things that you should be doing as an artist related to your career. I think it's valuable. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. (laughs) Ta-da! I'm honored to be with you guys today. Thank you so much. This podcast is all about the Plein Air movement. And the Plein Air movement, as you know, is taking the world by storm. And I'm proud to report that What's happening in America is spreading across Europe, even China. I'm going to be actually taking a trip to China there to do a story on the massive Chinese plein air movement, which is actually mostly watercolor. We're also seeing a big surge in watercolor attendance at the convention and watercolor plein air painting. As a matter of fact, at my recent Fall Color Week, lots of watercolorists, more than I think ever. Plus, of course, a lot of gouache and, and, and acrylic. In fact, at the coming Denver Plein Air Convention this May, we've added two new tracks. We have, of course, an oil track, a watercolor track, and a pastel track. We have a demo stage, which kind of absorbs a lot of different things. We're also adding a, um, an acrylic track with some of the great acrylic Plein Air painters. Uh, because we're doing this because we're seeing so much more interest in acrylic and a lot of acrylic people who want to come, who feel like they need their own thing. So you're going to have your own track, your own instructors. Of course, anybody at any track can go to anything. The other thing we're doing is we're launching a new event planners track. And this is for anybody and everybody who works with a city or a town or a charity, anybody who's creating plein air events where you're attracting collectors, bringing painters in and selling artwork. We want the best practices to take place to keep these things healthy. And so uh, because there's been a couple of shows that have been on the rocks lately, we, we want to make sure that doesn't happen to any of the other shows. And, of course, there's still more and more shows being launched every year. So the right thing to do is to go to this event planners track. The way it's going to work, you go to the full convention. You get access to everything. You get to see all the demonstrations, all the artists, the expo hall, all everything. And then at the time at which the painters all go out painting every day, that's when your tracks take place. So while they're out painting for two or three hours or four hours or half day or whatever it happens to be, then you get uh, all this great information on how to make your track, how to make your plein air event stronger. So that's going to be at the plein air convention. Uh, Also, you know, I've been really trying to look for ways to grow the plein air movement. Uh, I've been devoting my life to this for the past 15 years and it is happening, but something big is happening. We have uh, a deal now with a national television network. It's a major network. And we're going to do a national show about plein air painting. It's going to get a lot of attention. And we're going to be casting to get various plein air painters to get involved with the show because we think it's important to show the people out there that are part of this community. So we'd like you to take a, a minute and fill out a casting call application. And don't tell yourself you're not worthy. You know, the, the uh, network is looking for all kinds of different people, lots of diversity, lots of different variety, and uh, you don't assume that you don't deserve to be on the show. Don't even tell yourself that. 
right? It's not necessarily about your artwork. You can learn more about it, and it's all at the, uh, the website, which is the Great Outdoor Painting Challenge.com. The Great Outdoor Painting Challenge.com. If you want to go to the Plein Air Convention, that's Plein Air Convention.com. And today's podcast, coincidentally, or maybe not so, is sponsored by Lil at All Art Instruction Videos, which has been around for like 32 years, creating videos on, on instruction. They have a great video, actually two of them, on how to paint like Van Gogh. One is a landscape painting and the other is a portrait painting video. And it's from uh, Dina Peterson, who was one of the animators who painted the Van Gogh movie, so they really learned how to do Van Gogh well. Anyway, uh, that video is at Lil at All Art Instruction. It's a tough name, but you can find it at Lily, L-I-L-I, artvideo.com. Lily Artvideo.com. Then just search Van Gogh once you're in there and you'll find it. Okay. Coming up after the interview, I'll be answering your art marketing questions in the marketing minute. But let's get right to this fascinating interview with Theo Maidendorp from the Van Gogh Museum, the world's leading expert on Van Gogh. Theo Maidendorp, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you. So you're in Amsterdam, is that right? I'm in Amsterdam, yeah. I'm at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Yeah. So I, I, you and I met uh, two or three years ago when uh, Peter Trippi and I brought our, our fine art group to the Van Gogh Museum, and you, you took us back to the conference room, took us behind the scenes, and told us a lot of stories. Yeah. And I thought this would be yeah. interesting to share with, with our listeners. We have a lot of landscape painters, uh, plein air painters, who, uh, who, who obviously look up to Van Gogh, and, and I'd like to uh, just kind of talk to you about um, his life and his story. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, the, you're welcome. <laughs> the, thank you. The big debate, those of us in America typically say Van Gogh. Uh, what is the proper yeah. pronunciation of his name? Yeah, I think, it, I think in England they used to say Van Gogh, like that's the GH as, as a Gogh. Uh, it, in Dutch, it is these it horrible guttural G's that we have. It's Van Gogh. And uh, the artist was very well aware that this name would never work uh, uh, during his lifetime. So we always signed him Vincent, and he, he was always addressed to us Vincent, so by his first name, because nobody could pronounce the Van Gogh. Oh, really? I never had known that. See, I've learned something new already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's how it goes. <laughs> so before we begin, I think it would be nice to talk about the, the beautiful museum that you have there for the people who have never yet had a chance to visit. Help us understand um, the purpose of the museum and, and what it's like. Yes, well, the museum was uh, built, so I mean, opened in, in 1973. And what we generally, as people who work at the museum, refer to is that the, the, the collection that we have in the museum is what we call the family collection. And it has to do with the fact that when Vincent died in 1890, uh, he, didn't, he hadn't sold many of his works. And most of it uh, stayed with his brother, Theo, who was very influential and very important to him throughout his life. Theo died very shortly after Vincent, only a couple of months later. And then his widow and the little son were left with this immense legacy of all these paintings and drawings by Vincent. And over the first 20 years, you might say, 20, 30 years, uh, she saw the collection to get Vincent's name better known and his works better known for over, especially Europe, so with collectors and especially firstly in Germany, but over in South Africa and England and America. And uh, to establish, and she published the letters as well. And so around from around 1925, she stopped, I went abruptly after, after she died. So a stop orders came on the selling from the collection. And what was left, which was still uh, about 200 paintings and about 500 drawings and also paintings from other artists and, and the letters and the things, were kept together uh, by the son, who was also called Vincent Willem van Gogh. And he was the founder of the museum, so he thought it necessary after the first, after the Second World War, to um, to, to, well, to take care of this collection in the sense that it was something for the common good and for the public to enjoy. And he put everything into a foundation, uh, the Vincent van Gogh Foundation. And this foundation uh, uh, was, was sold the collection partly and uh, it remained in place to the Dutch state on the stipulation that it would, that it would build a museum for the collection and that it would 
uh, maintain it and keep it and, and keep it running and keep the works uh, in check and everything. So that's what happened. And so it opened in 73 uh, to the public uh, and, um, well, the, the numbers of visitors, and that's the incredible thing, you might say, because it's a, a museum dedicated to one person could easily turn into a mausoleum. Uh, but we make all kinds of exhibitions, and, and over the years, so we're almost existed for 50 years. In a couple of years, in 2023, it's the 50 year anniversary of our museum, and the numbers of people who come to the museum grow and grow. It's as if the, the popularity of Vincent uh, rises every year, which is a quite an amazing thing. Well, this is uh, for the for the people who are listening. That you know, the the assumption might be that this is a small house or something. That this museum is a yeah. wor- world class museum. And first off, it's beautifully designed. It's modern and it's huge. It's a massive yeah. property. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It, is. it, well, it was the first design, what we call now the old museum, so the main building, which was built in seventy three, is, is designed by a Dutch architect Gerrit Pietsop, which also quite known from from his modernism. And uh, we had a, 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 an extra wing attached to it in, in, in the late 1990s to, because of uh, we needed extra space for for the temporary exhibitions, and uh, so we we we, we well we've got a lot more space and uh, we got a new entrance a couple of years ago, so it was there was more space for people to come in, and it's now nowadays we get more than two million people a year who visit us, which yeah. is for a museum which which is only dedicated to one artist, of course, it's quite a lot. Now, where is the the largest single collection of Van Gogh's paintings outside of that museum. That is another museum in the Netherlands. That's uh, that's the the Krillemuller Museum. It's called, and that is of uh, Mrs. Krillemuller, who was of Dutch birth, of uh, German birth. She's an American industrialist. Um, she dedicated her life one to the collecting of modern art, uh, with a um, with a heavy focus on on Vincent van Gogh. And her collection is the second largest. It's, an, it's, it's situated, it's a beautiful museum in the center of the Netherlands in a national park, also designed by a world famous architect, uh, Arvind van der Felder. And uh, her collection is, well, they, they have about, about 85 pictures of Vincent and about 180 drawings of him. So that's also quite, quite substantial. Together with the Van Gogh Museum and the Prilla Miller Museum together, you have uh, uh, more than a third of, of Vincent's complete oeuvre in the Netherlands. Um, and after that, it goes for well, the Metropolitan in New York has a, has, a, has a large collection, and the Musée d'Orsay in, in Paris has a large collection, and then you get to do some of the smaller ones. But every American, every American um, museum in, in, the, in the big cities, like in Chicago, or you go to Los Angeles, you go to San Francisco, you will always find a Van Gogh, or one or two, maybe three or four. So live in America, you, you have a good chance to, to, to walk into it. Are there are there a lot of fakes out there? You you and I were talking when when we visited that I, I think the question I ask is do you get people who contact you and say hey I think I have an original uh, Vincent painting do you you tell me about that, that and tell me how how you determine yeah. if they're real or not yeah it, it's quite a complex pr- pr- process what we do is that we do uh, uh, appraisals in the sense of education you can ask for our opinion if you think you've got a Van Gogh you can ask for our opinion. But we have a, a quite a strict procedure for this because we get about 200, between 200 and 300 applications a year. Um, so this, that's, that is quite a lot. And uh, so what we ask people to do is that they, they have to do everything online and they can send up images. And uh, if we decide that we want to see it, we let them know. But in general, let's say that more than 90, 95% of everything that is sent to us we will never, never ask to, uh, never ask to, to have it to have it shipped to the museum to have a look at it, and that's because what we also get is quite a lot of reproductions, for instance. So we get uh, clearly the things from flea markets uh, uh, with with, with uh, iconography and what I call we might see landscapes from 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 Italy or for the Middle East or whatever, and we know that it was never there. And uh, so there were all kinds of these these, these things for people, but of course. It, because since his, his work is so high praised and it's also worth quite a lot of money, uh, a lot of people hope that there's a small possibility that it might be that thing go, but we have to disappoint by far the majority of every everybody who, who comes to us. But every once in a while, we do discover something that is sent to us. And that's also the reason why we still do it, uh, is that, uh, of course, you the, the, the Finson's entire oeuvre and, and work is, is, is pretty well... Uh, for that. I and mean, we know where, the, where some holes are, what you might expect that something might pop up, but it's not much. 
Um, but you always have to be aware. I mean, we're certainly, we certainly we were aware of that because in in some beginning of 2000, about 2011, 2012, somebody came up to us with a very large painting, uh, supposedly from the um, the high period of Vincent when he was in the south of France in Arles, uh, of a, a large landscape painting. And, and and this one we had come because it looked very good. And and then we, we made a big discovery. I mean, this is the, this, this was uh, an enormous thing, which a, a, a picture that that literally went into hiding. It was stuffed in the attic. And, and a lot of people come with these stories that something is stuffed in the attic, and usually don't pay attention to it. Yeah, yeah, that's how the stories go. But this one was actually stored in the attic. So we keep a keen eye on for for what is uh, getting coming along. But uh, the majority uh, that we get uh, is uh, pretty, pretty hopeless, I'm, just, uh, I'm afraid to say. Now, do you have, uh, be- because he wrote so many letters to his brother, did he pretty much document everything that he was painting during that period of time? So you can refer back to the no. letters? Or? Yeah. Yeah, not, not everything. And, and, and when you when we go through the letters, and, and I mean, they're now online since 2009, and everybody can get, go, go through them. Um, there are... You, you have them in two ways. We have paintings and drawings that were never mentioned in the letters, and especially into drawings. I mean, he made a lot of them, so a lot of them are not mentioned in the letters. A painting that was slightly more important to him when, uh, after a certain time. We're very bad informed about his Paris situation, because when he went to Paris, the two years that he lived there, so in 1886 and 1887, he spent his time with his brother. So he was living there, so there was no need to write. So there are very few letters from that period, which also means that we are uh, much less informed about his uh, painting activities then. So we have a lot of things from the Paris period, but uh, telling me, for instance, is that uh, especially flower still lives from the Paris period um, are, are very often, there are quite a lot of fakes from, 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 from that period because uh, forger, forgers already early on knew when Vincent Letters were, were, were published that this was somewhat of, of, of a very unknown period. So if you want to make your <laughs> fortune or faith and then go, choose the Paris period because there's <laughs> not much known about it. <laughs> when you go further, when you go to the south of France, we're very well informed. So there are, uh, it's just, the, most of the works that he mentions in the letters we know of. There are a couple of them that we don't know of, so that he sent to people and they never uh, uh, reappeared. So this is still a potential work. So he made so maybe about 10 paintings that can still pop up. So we're on the lookout in that case. Well, I, it's, it's, so I, I'm curious about uh, when, when when Van Gogh first began. Big, I'll say Van Gogh because that's what we say here. But uh, yeah, yeah, w- that's it. <laughs> yeah. When when, uh, when he first got his training, uh, I'd like to understand his training uh, because th- he developed yeah. a style at some particular point. I don't know if it was intentional or unintentional, but I, I'm curious about. I, I had, for instance, a, a collector come to me one time, and he said, "I have a." A Van Gogh painting, and I want to sell it. And I and I looked at it, uh, and, and to me, it didn't look like it could possibly be his hand. It was very academic. Yeah. It was very, uh, very carefully drawn. And he said, "Well, this came out of his yeah. academic period when you know when he first learned, and so he hadn't yet developed the style." I didn't buy it, but is, is that the case? Yeah. I mean, what what are his paintings no, like well, in that early stage? Yeah. Well, we have to take into consideration so it was only 10 years that he, that, he, that he worked as an artist, so late in life. So he started when he was 27. And the reason why he started so, lot, so, so late was partly because he didn't have much faith in that he could do anything, that he had, that he had a trained hand or that he, he had no natural gift, he was a natural talent to draw. And especially perspective and proportions were very difficult for him to, to capture. It's only when he learned more about perspective that you had tricks to, to, to learn perspective with a perspective frame that you could square up a, up a drawing and then look through a grid and things like that, that he got a more steady hand, you might say. Um, but it's not uh, like he never had a, a real formal training. So there are not really strictly academic works in, in that sense. He did follow some classes at some, some point when he was in the Academy of, of, of Antwerp very shortly. So we have drawings from, from that period and also afterwards in Paris when he was with uh, Comor, so a private studio for, for a couple of months. So there we have some nudes and, 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 and but drawings mainly, uh, which have a, a, a classical or you might say academic approach. But the funny thing is, is that whereas uh, you might say the, the full academicians and the trained academic and traditional painters and, and draftsmen, from, from them when you see when they're drawing nudes and then drawing after the model, you can't really distinguish usually the one, one hand from the other. I mean, they're all the same. Uh, the funny thing is that with Vincent, you can recognize it because 
he has this, this very well said, this awkward way of, of drawing sometimes, this roughness, which he adds, which makes his, uh, uh, his academic mood, you might say, less, less traditional, less academic, because he's focusing on other things. So that, that's, that's the major difference. And from the very first beginning, so when he was only just starting, only about 27, 28, it was drawing first, and he drew a lot of copies after Masters, and very few of them have, uh, uh, were, um, we still know of, because most of them have disappeared over the years, and he has also uh, destroyed quite a lot of these early works because he didn't want to interfere with his later work. And something that he more or less uh, uh, said in a letter, very late letter, when he was in the south of France to a colleague artist, from Belgium, is he said because he had been working also in the Borinage in Belgium at a certain time, and he said, "Well, of course, I destroyed all these works because I mean that, that was just just the simple and, and thing. So that's not that very worthwhile. It's 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 exactly it's those those drawings that you make at that time is the drawings that you use to train your hands. So they have no other value than that. And some of them you keep with you because they will you succeed very well. So we have a couple of them." And from that, you can tell he was a quite an apt copyist of, of, of uh, prints and, 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 and drawing courses and, and things like that. But the moment when he started painting, his first paintings, he never had a real formal training. So there was just uh, a, fam- a family member was Anton Morvo, was an accomplished painter in the, in the Netherlands. He had some lessons by him in painting, his first lessons, but the rest he did by himself. But he had more, you might say, a gift of natural talent as a colorist. Then he had, then the way he had to conquer his draw, his, his drawing, and uh, and from the beginning when his first painting, so they're absolutely not classical, but they were very well um, focused and he meant and, and viewed. So he was very a very keen looker, you might say, and to, to translate that in a, in a quite rough way. So from the beginning, his brushwork is quite rough. So when you would find a painting with a very smooth finish and academic-like things, it's, you're already already quite sure that it's way off what Hoch was uh, was was doing. Interesting. So I, I want to go back uh, a couple of steps. We were talking about his sister-in-law, and um, yeah. and I always heard that that he only sold one painting in his lifetime, and and I don't know if that's documented yes. or not. But um, it, oh, she, yeah, no, it's, not, it's not exactly true. There's one of these one of these uh, you might say myths that there are a lot of these, these myths of misinterpretations with, uh, around fencing, which happens with with, with every uh, people. So it's true that he sold one painting, you might say, for um, and, 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 and according to market value. Uh, but when he was in, and that was about 400 francs in those days. So he, he sold a painting for 400 francs in 1890s, so, and, and, and that was born as to myth that it was the only painting he sold. But he sold more when he was living in Paris. With smaller amounts, we have more evidence that, that every once in a while he would sell a little thing. But this average price is of 10, 15 francs. Of course, he would exchange works with other artists as well. And so it is a bit, and so there is one painting that he actually sold for, you might say, market value. And uh, but it's certainly not the only painting that he sold. Yeah, I was curious about that because as, as an artist myself and a, m- many of the people listening are artists, uh, we oftentimes yeah. will have somebody approach us and they'll we'll sell a painting off of the easel. You know, we're out and there's somebody else walks yeah. up and says, "Would you be willing to sell it?" And the answer is always yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's some, that's some price. Yeah. Not always, but uh, so I, I, I suspect that would happen, especially in a place like Paris. So do, yes, well, 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 yeah, but, but, but we're not exactly people who, who, who would walk by and, say, and immediately bought it from the usual, you might say. Um, but uh, in Paris, he, he, he certainly was in contact with, with other artists as well, and he was exhibiting a little bit. So, and, and we know from some bills that we found afterwards that he did paintings and he made a portrait for someone so he's supposedly probably got some money for it as well and so there are these um things pointing towards uh, some selling so at at the time but uh, no, oh go ahead go ahead no no but but not much i mean it's, it's, it's not it's, he didn't sell much that's it's to be said yeah and henry must have been already in the very beginning when he was drawing he got a commission from one of his uncles to uh, to for, for some drawing so I mean, so he sold something there as well, although it was family related. <laughs> yeah, and of course today, if we if we sell a painting, we take a picture with our iPhone real quickly, and then we sell it, put the cash in our pocket, and would never document it probably. So, I think uh, I yes, think there's probably yes. things like Often that. Happens, yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah. the influence of other artists uh, set the stage at the time yeah. that he was living. This was uh, most of the art world was in a very academic period. When we see his work today, yeah. it, it it's obviously it's exceptional, but 
it, it doesn't necessarily, we don't realize how much it did not fit in at the time. Can you kind of set the stage yeah. and, and help us understand what that was like? Yeah. Well, interestingly, so when we, what we usually define, for instance, working period is 10 years in two, in two separate periods. So you have a Dutch period, the first five years, which is a period of training. And when this palette is, is more traditional, it's darker. But the brushwork was already quite vivid and, and, and very uh, direct, you might say. Um, but when he goes to Paris and discovers then the Impressionists and what was going on there, his palette completely changes and he becomes a, a full colorist and that he embarks upon further when he goes to the south of France. Now, this period in Paris, in 86, 87, it was probably, it probably was at most, the most exciting time you could be in Paris at, that, at the moment of art, modern art. Because the, the, you might say, the Impressionists already claiming, getting some name and claim to fame and everything. And there was a whole group of young artists who were embarking on different paths. So there was Seurat who was there with the pointillism experiments that he did from, from 1883, 1884 onwards, with Signoc next to him. There was this younger group of in Benmar and, and Paul Gauguin who, who, who came on the scene at the same time as, 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 uh, as Otto Dardax who, who taught himself. And Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, so famous for his process afterwards, was a young boy and they were all training in Paris at the time. And Vincent was one of them, and was, was more projected between them. And there was an interaction between all these artists of what somebody was doing. Everybody was looking for a, a new original style, you might say. And it's in that period that Vincent's style goes all kinds of ways. There's influence of the Impressionists uh, in, in one sense for looser brushwork, but also brighter coloring. But also the experiments he does that what he, what he learned, more or less learned from people like to the to Luther Trek, but also a bit of Degas which is, is working with diluted paints. So you use a lot of turpentine within your oil paint to make it more, more fluid, you might say. And you work on your canvas and the uh, turpentine immediately evaporates and you get this, this gouache-like, uh, uh, watercolor-like uh, oil paint on, on your work, which gives a different sheen on, on, on the, uh, the total experience of the, of, the, of the painting. So there's all the experiments. And it's also these two years that he... Um, goes into, you might say, a bohemian life that he discovers also that the heavy drinking and you know, all, this, that all these things that are always romantically attached to or to, to being an artist. Up to a point in the end, he discovers, that's a very important thing, he discovers Japanese prints. Uh, he, he has an enormous collection, hundreds of, 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 of Japanese prints, and he admires very much just his flat coloring, the outlines, the contours, and those kinds of things. So he starts experimenting with that as well. So there's this whole all these things coming together and there's a big model in what, what, what Paris was and it also becomes too much for him. So the point that he uh, disappears from Paris and goes to the south of France after two years is partly because it was getting on his nerves and he had to, to find a more quiet place where he could work on his own. And he chose for the south of France and hoped that it would be the closest to Japan that he could get in the sense of brightness of coloring and everything and, and find his own style, you might say. So this is a very important period, and, and, and lots of artists in that time are very important for him, in, in, indeed, for to, to open up his, his vocabulary, you might say, of brush trucks, of, of, of experimenting with color. And the whole thing about the color theory is what he discovers there. And, 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 and that, from that moment on, he is absolutely one of the best colorists that is walking around in, in Paris at the time. He picks it up quickly, and his whole intention afterwards and the paintings that he does afterwards is always working with the, the, the pure primary colors you might say some of the broken tones to diminish them a little bit and search for the, for the complementary contrast or the, 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 the harmonies and the contrast and that's, and that's what in fact what Fajor's painting is all about after that, that period and that makes it so interesting to, to look at do we, do we, I, I get the impression uh, from, from the things that I've read that he if he were born today, we would say that he might have uh, he might be on the autism scale, or he might be a little bit socially unacceptable, or or maybe yes. ADHD or some such thing. Uh, do, do yeah. you um, do you have a sense that if if it were not for his sister in law and her efforts yeah. over the rest of her life to to kind of promote him? Do you think that he would have just blended in like so many other artists that never became famous? I'm not quite sure. It's uh, also very difficult to tell, of course. It is, it, 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 it is difficult. And when in the appreciation of Simpson's art, I mean, his life story, of course, is, is important. And for instance, all these letters, and didn't know anything of his life, and Simpson had the art once. Would it be 
wouldn't he have made the same same claim to fame as as as, as, as the others? In a way, it's difficult if you when you're working with his artists for such a long time and you know it's worked so well, and you're with it every day. You might say is that uh, it's difficult not to think that he would 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 have been would have become famous. And uh, it has to do with which, which every painting or well, every painting, but I mean the paint his his, his his best paintings do is that they uh, give you such a, uh, a wonderful feeling in the sense of the sheer in, in, in the joy that must have been how, how he made them. There's something in the brushwork and in the, the calm and quiet sometimes, but also in the liveliness, uh, on the other hand, which is something about the sheer joy of painting that you, you can detect from. We had a, we had a Hockney show uh, this year with Dave Hockney, was also very much influenced by by Vincent. He was very much focused on that, on that, and having David Hockney, it was more or less the same. When you look at his art from from the last ten years, for instance, it is the sheer joy of painting. I mean, the colors they jump at you. Of course, there are massive scale pictures that he makes, but it's the same attitude towards art in a certain way, and that's what Hockney recognizes in Van Gogh. Although we must always realize that these these beautiful pictures that he makes and which appear so hopeful uh, often, uh, you might say, are done with uh, by somebody who had um, a difficult nervous system. So uh, be very careful in, in, in diagnosing him with, with a certain kind of psychological uh, uh, disability uh, or whatever. But a couple of years ago, we had a symposium on this and an exhibition it was called On the Virtue of Insanity. Because Vincent, of course, is... is we are often um, seen as, as this, this, this crazy artist and, and uh, that. And we did this because to show that he was absolutely not crazy. Well, you can tell from his letters that people who are always crazy can't write these beautiful letters. And so coherently as well. It was somebody um, with a very nervous, you might say, disposition in life from, from the beginning. So it's a character trait, you might say. And with the mishaps and the misfortunes that he had and, and this complicated character, uh, in the end, um, complicated with the, the, with the excess abuse of, of alcohol and, and not taking very well care of himself in terms of, of food and, and, and things like that. And, and having, especially when he was in the south of France and Arles, then Colgan came over and there was this artistic duo also at the same time. The stress became enormous. And that's when it explained itself in, 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 a, in a psychosis and, and in a deterioration of his mental state, you might say, periodically. Uh, afterwards, and in the end, to this, this, this sad act that he that he took his own life. Um, it's not something that is immediately recognizable in the pictures, although his, um, his, his subject matter, you might say, in the way he sometimes uh, presents himself, especially in the last year of his life, there's and quite a lot of can be um, attached, you might say, to his psychological situation at the time. Do you do you think his uh, if, if if you're able to uh, create a map of when you knew he was going through these psychological issues or these, uh, the, the, when he yeah. was, he was, he was living in an insane asylum. I don't know if he was put there or if he just lived there yeah. because it was convenient. No, we voluntarily, he was, he was voluntarily, when, the, the problem was when he, uh, the, the first time when the psychosis appeared for the first time, so it was in our, in, at the end of 1888, and that's when he cut off his ear. So this is this tragic act. And that was the result of his two months living together with Gauguin, and, and he had his hopes set for finding his place of his own in the South and creating something for all the modern artists. So a place where everybody could come and work in harmony together as a big brotherhood or whatever. And Gauguin was the first, well, he was the designated leader of that, 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 those companionships. And he was the first to come. Uh, but it was quite clear already after a month, two months, that the, the, the artistic temperaments were very different between the two. And, and more or less, Vincent lost hope in what he aimed to do in the south of France is creating something new with this little yellow house that he had, the studio that he had, comfortable. He had for, for a very long time, he was living on his own, he had a house, he had a place of his own. And, and that went completely wrong. And that led to intense discussions about art with Gauguin, into some, you might say, some electrical, some, 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 some short circuit in, in his head. And it simply exploded. And he did this, this very strange deed of cutting up his ear of which we don't know why it was a year. And it's very difficult to, 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 to find an answer to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's just as heavy as it sounds now as it was then. And um, take it to hospital where we got a, a serious psychosis. But after two weeks, so the beginning of January, he felt completely well again. And he looked at himself and said, well, this is just a temporarily thing. I'll get back to myself and start working again. But then the crisis became, there were new crises, smaller ones when he was still an R.O. 
And he realized that something else had to be done. So he knew quite well, and also the doctors knew quite well, that he was not mad, but that he had some kind of unexplainable psych, psych what you might say, psychosis that was coming back after a couple of weeks, months, sometimes two months. And then he realized the best thing to do is to prevent that he was um, enforced to go to into asylum, uh, which would have been in Marseille or Aix-en-Provence. Um, the, the, the Protestant minister was in, you know, looked around a little bit if there was a, if there were other solutions, and they found this asylum, which was a private asylum, uh, which you can enlist yourself voluntarily. Which had the benefit, of course, is that you could also get released <laughs> if you want to. That's, that's you were the kind of a, to go somewhere. that's the kind of asylum yeah. I want to be in. <laughs> <laughs> What we sometimes and that's the, 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 the silly thing about what what, what, what what we learned in the museum and dealing with this disease in the last couple of years and we're still we're still working on, on on a book on it as well on this pit on this period is that both realized more when you're an art historian and you look at the work and you look at the artists and you divide everything simply into periods so you have the art period the semi period and then all there and that usually does not really in his life, of course, it's just a continuous stream. It's not like the separated um, uh, pieces of the, the, the glue together. Uh, and the way is that you tend to, to, to look at the San Remy period, oh, yeah, that's where the money's on the side, and as something on the side. But of course, it's quite serious. And that's what he realized himself. So when he was taken there, it's in the beginning of May 1889, the first few weeks he was not allowed to the asylum, so he could work a little bit in the garden. And it was just for observation. And it was quite clear for the doctors there that he was not mad. But at the same time, there were not that many male patients at, at the moment, about 15 or 16. But those were severe cases. There were a lot of crying and, and, and really mad people walking around. So it's very difficult to just think about it, that you're walking around in a, in, in, in a place like that with these other people, and, and and you're quite sure that you're not one of them because you don't have those complaints that they have. Well, you had this hallucination with the book periodically. But then all, all of a sudden, while he was in the asylum in the summer of, of 1889, he suffered a very severe crisis and a new psychosis that lasted for about a month and a half. And what he afterwards said was the, it was worse than whatever he had in, in Arles. And that made him realize that he was perhaps more of a patient uh, and more alive to the people who his invention might say at, at the same time. Whereas, and that's also the moment that he wanted to get out of it because he knew he wasn't, but maybe he would become one. And it was perhaps better to get out of it than stay there. Otherwise, he would become maybe really mad. And uh, so, and that explains a bit of the situation that how that after the summer of 1889, also his look on art and, and also in, in, in this working process, process is, is changing gradually. So its colors become more subdued. So the brighter colors from, from Arl and beginning of Sam make place for more broken tones. And it's deliberately. He even says sometimes that, uh, that he knows exactly how to adjust a, a bright lit orangey sunlit sky with a setting sun, but it's too bright. It's, 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 it's too cheerful. And he knows exactly how to model it a little bit with, with, some, with some greenish paint to make it slightly less attractive, but a very a much better expression of how he feels himself. Well, do we, so do, very so subtly, it's not exactly... Do, oh, sorry? Do, we, do we think that, that that was a result of depression, or was that just a growing experience? Because, you know, many artists, when they get to yeah. a point in their in their walk or their 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 process, find they start graying everything down, and, and because, they, you know, they oftentimes start yeah. with intense color, and then they realize that things look better when they're not quite so intense... That's a matter of opinion. So I wonder yes, if maybe yes. this was just a maturation as an artist. It, well, it is in a way, but he, of course, he comes from a very dark period, and he especially seeks and looks at for the brighter colors and get them right. And but it's quite clear from his lessons also the subject matter that he that he uh, that goes into after after the the, 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 the summer of eighteen eighty nine that it's especially in the, in the asylum that it gets a bit more gloomy um, in, in in a certain way. But always, mm -hmm. but. Sometimes, and it's the what what happened to him. He writes this in a letter to to his sister Wilhelmine, for instance. Is that and it is also to well that that must be the horror for every plein air painting. Is that uh, he had sometimes and was simply walking in nature and with his with his gear, is that all of a sudden could feel extremely lonely, and almost terrified by the by the sheer impression of nature, and that that, that he couldn't do anything, and when that happens and you realize that and, and then. Well, your, your life situation, of course, is, is changing in what you're doing. So his remedy in general was just 
just keep on working steadily. And so take your mind away from, from try to, to get your mind away from that. Just keep on working. And in the end, when he left the asylum, so after again, quite a long period when, of, 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 of a depressing period, and he went back to the north, closer to his brother and, and uh, to Auvers, who was uh, close to Paris in the end, is that uh, his, his output was enormous. Um, again, so we, we, have, he, we, 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 we lived there for 17 days and we have slightly over 70 pictures that he painted, and then apart from, say, 30, 40 drawings and all the letters that he was writing. And that's not the sign of somebody who was very happy frolicking around in the, in the countryside of Auvers, but it was somebody who had to do something to keep his mind from other things. Yeah. And and in some yeah and I, and I believe that what, what you see in this, this later work from Auvers, which is uh, the sh- it is at the same time it's sheer painterly expression because his his, his brushwork is so loose and so effective you might say, but it's also somebody who's in extreme hurry in a way. One wonders if um, if there are artists today that are suppressed because they have schizophrenia and they're on modern medications so that yeah. kind of kind of suppress that if if that that angst or that um, the, the 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 experiences of being uh, mentally mentally ill or me- having moments of being mentally ill if if that's yeah. what really drove uh, the brilliance of his work yes it's true for Fenton also is good Okay, when he had this, when he really was in, 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 this, in these periods of, of, of psychosis and all what it did, that he was very depressed, he could not work. So it's the moment that he uh, came out of these depressions and, and, and some, he, he, it could be something with a snap in the sense of things, like, like a curtain drawn away. All of a sudden, they know he, and he could work. And they would immediately start, start to work on, on, on painting. And so it's not what people always have, have, have long been thinking, for instance, is that this, this part of his, this remarkable brushwork of his is part of his because he was mad in doing it while he had these, uh, these shifts, but he didn't. So he worked in between when he, was, when he had a clear head, you might say. But with a clear head, you also, you realize it was quite well of what happened to you. So it's, it's always close in, 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 in that respect. So it always influences, in a way, um, the way you're painting or drawing. Now, those of us who are plein air painters, um, uh, oftentimes what, what we paint in the field is a lot different than what we paint in the studio. So in the field, we might be yeah. just trying to capture the essence of color and light and, and form and you know get, get some big brush strokes down. And then yeah. oftentimes we'll bring it into the studio and then that studio painting might end up being more refined. Some painters will keep it exactly the same. But can can you tell a difference between Van Gogh when he did outdoor painting versus indoor painting? Yeah. Well, outdoor painting was for Vincent the most was quintessential, you might say, because what was quintessential to him was that he had the motive in, had to have the motive in front of him uh, at the, in the first place. Uh, part of the the artistic uh, uh, rivalry, you might say, with Gauguin is that Gauguin was, was more or less the other way around. Gauguin was somebody who did not like to be out in the open to paint, but he preferred to make the sketches outside and went into the studio and then think up things with the, the sketches that he made. So assemble and compose something inside, so more out of memory and out of the head. And that was very difficult for Vincent, and he tried this in, 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 in Arles, uh, the, the time when Gauguin came. He tried to do something by heart. He also tried to do some religious things, things that he destroyed afterwards because he, he wasn't satisfied with it. And some of these works that he did by heart are not his, absolutely not his best works. Uh, for Vincent, it was, as he always said, so the motive was in, in, in front of him was important, but it, of course, was, as, as you say, every plein air paint, of course, adapts and focuses on the general mood or on several details. You will not come to too detailistic. And for him, it was the most important thing to, and, and, and we can tell from even his large paintings that usually about 80% of it was done in one session. So uh, even the larger ones. And, 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 and then, but he would always go back to it, bring it back to the studio and rework it a little bit and adjust aesthetically. So if, you, if it was too red on one side, so you balance it a little bit on the other side. And he even said, well, there is a point in, in, in Arl when he's working there for a couple of months. And of course, he, is, he, he does not have an artistic scene about it. There's a lot of paints who can judge and, and talk about art. And he's not quite sure whether 
he is perhaps painting too quickly. That he, when he senses paintings to to fear, that people won't like it because it's too sloppy. Maybe perhaps too quickly done. The brushwork is not precise and minute enough. Um, but he warns fear. He says, well, people may say it's too quickly painted, but remember that always before I send the paintings to you, I always work them up a little bit. And you usually can see in Simpson when you analyze Simpson's uh, pictures when we have them in the studio with our with our conservators, that indeed you will always find in, in the Van Gogh's pictures small additions, usually graphic lines to just enhance the certain parts. So and to maybe to hide a little bit of the, the too intense and too quick uh, brushwork. But on the other hand, what I what we generally like so much about Vincent's work is exactly that quick brushwork. Because, um, and, and that's also part of the reason, for instance, why it, it's so incredibly difficult, difficult to, to fake or to forge uh, Vincent's paintings. Because what he developed over the years was a very, very quick hand. And the way he controls his hand in, in putting on the paint is quite exceptional. And when anybody tries to mimic that, is is that you 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 try to mimic something in, in a slow way how somebody else is painting quickly, and that you can always tell. So if there is something to learn, I believe from from uh, people who admire Vincent's works and 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 they like to well maybe start in this traditional and to learn something from it is that it's simply painting a lot and, and train your hand, and then you can do uh, what you want in a way in the same sense. Caption quickly the essence of what you see in front of you in one single painting. I, I wonder if there's any documentation of anyone who documented obser- observation of him painting. And the reason I ask that is because, you know, we have mm. this assumption that certain painters are fast painters because it looks rushed and it looks brushy. And, and yeah. you know, ha- you know, a, a great example of that is Sargent. And yet documentation on Sargent said that he made those strokes very... Yeah very slowly and very deliberately, but they look rushed. Yeah. And and the same would be true yeah. with a contemporary... And Monet did the same, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and also with some contemporary painters like Richard Schmidt, who is very slow and very deliberate, but it looks like, you know, it's got this massive speed yeah. and energy to it. So d- is there anyone yeah. who's actually observed him painting that, that, that talked about it? To know whether he really did paint not, fast or not. Yeah, yes, not not that many, but we know is, is that is that there is a thing that Pizarro uh, remembered uh, from uh, from the time in, in Paris, is that uh, that uh, they came across Vincent in, in in Montmartre, and he was just coming back from 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 from, from painting in Amiens, and he had four or five studies with him, wow. which he had did <laughs> just just in the morning <laughs> of painting. So it says something. So it didn't exactly see him painted, but it was realized it was done in, in the time he made his four or five studies. Yeah. Put him against the wall and start discussing what he was doing. Well, that would pretty and, much prove uh, it. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty much. And we know, I mean, it's something he says it himself. And, and uh, there is a, um, well, not, well, yeah, well, there is one, one painting, indeed, one of the, uh, in Ireland, seen from the bridge of Trinkatai with the Rhone River on the side of it is that he just that he just rambled it on in a couple in, in just in a couple in, in an hour and a half or something like that. Mm. And there is the portrait of the of the Ali Jen, so with, with the yellow background. It's not one of the Metropolitan, but the one that is in the Museum of Say, the first version. But he also said it, but it took me an hour. And that's a size thirty uh, 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 canvas, so it's it's a ninety by seventy centimeters. So it's a big one. Well I think that answers uh, another an question hour. that answers another question that I yeah. had then I think, which yeah. is have you have you any documentation of process? Uh, because some painters yep. will will lay down a thin layer, uh, let's say a turpentine layer, to kind of draw things out or kind of block things in, and then they'll lay paint oh, over them. But that he, no, that's, yeah, no, he, he, that, no, it's simple. It's a simple, uh, usually first sketch in the sense that every once in a while he prepares something a bit a bit more. Uh, when he found when he's found something which he thinks, well, this is going to be something, then he uh, or oh, he's found a motive that he wants to really pay some attention to. And one of them is the, the, the example that I gave of the harvest of the painting, uh, for instance, which is a beautiful, beautiful painting, painting in, in a day. But this, well, this one he prepared with two drawings that he made in the days um, before. Uh, and that was quite quite exceptional that he did this. So so he was quite keen on to have the decomposition right in that respect. And the funny thing is that when he painted the harvest, um, with Van Gogh, you can also you can also simply look at his outpour and, and what he did in, in a certain amount of time because we have all these letters. And then you realize when the harvest season began in Arles, we know quite from his letters it's quite quite clear that he started around, painting around the 9th of June. 
And by the 21st of June, so within two weeks, um, there was so much rain that the harvest broke off and he did other things. So within these 12 days almost, in, in the period between the 9th and the 21st of, 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 of June, uh, he painted 12 pictures. Uh, not only pictures on, about harvest scenes, but he also made four large drawings of harvest scenes connected to it. And he made a painting in the city of the Rhone River uh, as well, the one that he just put on very quickly. And he made a small painting of a girl's head. And it all within 12 days. So it says something about this sheer... And also, and it's also right this time that he writes to his brother. Somebody will probably think that I paint too quickly. But he also realized that he was, you know, with training his hand like that, he became more secure. But what he did, for instance, was that his drawing became, in that period, oh, quite important for him because also not being quite sure whether it was painted too quickly, was making copies, drawn copies after his paintings, uh, which he, in his drawings he would send to Amy Baimar in Paris, to his brother, and to John Peter Russell, an Australian painter who he met in, who met in Paris, just to give him an idea of what he was working on. But at the same time, he explained that by making these drawings after his paintings, and his drawings are so beautiful, I mean, he's very graphic, with all these small scribbles and lines and things like that. He was trying to get control also about his brushwork. So in mimicking with pen and ink, you might say, the, the scenes that he had painted, he could afterwards benefit again from painting other scenes from how he had drawn the other ones, getting, well, knowing more and learning more about the structure of the areas that you're drawing or painting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious, uh, for th this is not necessarily directly related, but it, I think it would be something for the artists who are listening. You know, there are artists who are listening who have, have very much the possibility of becoming uh, very well known, famous, either in their lifetimes or after their lifetimes. Van Gogh did something yeah. very special in that he, he documented his life, at least part of his life, through the letters to his brother. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, if Van Gogh were living today, those would be emails. And those emails, yeah. we'd, we'd be locked out because we wouldn't know his password. We wouldn't have them. What, what, is, what is your best advice to an artist who, uh, in, in terms of documenting their life or their work, uh, from the perspective of a museum curator, yeah. professional, what is it that you yeah. wish artists would all do? Well, um, and some artists in the past, and also from, from even a long time ago, did so. But I think, indeed, that that's often called us in call of plagiarism and things like that, is document your work. Uh, which has become much easier today with, with uh, I mean, there's a, a camera on every phone uh, nowadays. So, but, but document your work. And, um, and, and, and the, in, in the past, there were artists who kept some kind of, of an opus list. I made once before I embarked on Van Gogh, uh, you have this, I don't know if you know it, it's this, this academic painter, Al Matarama, Lawrence Al Matarama. He was, um, he was touched by birth, went to England, was the most famous painter, painter in the Victorian uh, era. Yeah, Peter and Trippi wrote he, he painted books just, about him. Peter Trippi wrote, yeah, exactly. Well, he, he made the exhibition, the Almatarum exhibition, yeah. then, uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I did one that 20 years ago in the Van Gogh Museum. <laughs> and, uh, but the Tarama, for instance, there were more paintings. They kept, they kept an opus list, what they called it. So they had, they had a, a work list. So every painting that he made, and they found worthwhile, so they got a, a, a Latin number. And, uh, and there's a very funny story attached to that because I think his, his list in the end, I think it goes up to well over 400 paintings. Um, but, and they're all documented. And so he had a list and they're still documented. But at a certain point, one of the uh, paintings uh, was destroyed. So one of the numbers. And it's quite remarkable. There are, because there are quite a lot of forgeries also by Alma Tadamad, but there are a couple which fill in that number <laughs> because they knew there's this one number that's failing. So, well, you make a new one and it's in the list and everybody is, is happy. So this is how it works. So in, in, in a way, documenting your work, uh, making lists, and, 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 and when you destroy things, then also destroy that part of the list, you might say. But I think that's an important thing also for, for afterwards. I mean, you can't uh, uh, say that uh, artists now uh, come on, write, let, write letters, write letters, so that, you know, because in, in, in certain respects, Vincent's correspondence is quite exceptional in the way he talks about art. And there, there are many more artist correspondences, but usually there are very simple letters of, of, of the groceries that had to be bought, or there was just this, this one, I'll see you tomorrow, and those kind of letters. And, 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 and the Vincent, because his brother was always 
paying him, sending him money. And usually, so when he would write back to his brother, was first because he had to write that the money arrived safely. So his brother knew this. And the second part is that the with the money, what he had done with the money. So he had to well, keep his brother uh, uh, informed of what he was doing. And that's why we know so much. So that's, when, that's how we can follow so closely. So his, his, his trials and tribulations through his life because he was well, he was writing almost two, three times a day, so, uh, a week sometimes. And that's, of course, quite exceptional. And it's also within, within artist correspondence that is very, very exceptional. Yeah. Journaling, I think journaling could, could accomplish the same thing if people would take the time. It would be, it, it yeah. seems like it would make, one of the things I encourage people to do is you can, you can pull up on your phone with an app, you can pull up the GPS location uh, and, and write yeah. the GPS location on the back of your painting. And that way, a yeah. uh, hundred years from now, uh, if, if anybody cares, then they can go to that GPS yeah. location and see, oh, there's a shopping mall here now. Uh, yeah, so. the shopping, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, say, but that's that's true because I've I've been going through all kinds of social hurdles to to sometimes to recall and then to to find back to, to some to ghost landscapes. For instance, the harvest scene. For instance, that is, it looks like it's in the middle of the fields with these outstretched fields in a way, and there's these couple of farms there in, in in the background. Whereas he was actually standing with his with his back against the railroad bridge, uh, on, on on just just outside of Arles, and the city was just behind it. But when you go there now, I mean, it's completely built over. <laughs> it's absolutely not this side anymore. So in, indeed, I mean, uh, if you want to know for for you know, the people want to 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 to, to find back uh, the beautiful uh, views that you've painted that, that that you've seen, it is an idea indeed to put the GPS coordinates uh, on the back of it. So very very. <laughs> well, I I, I, um, I I'd like to wrap up by talking about the story of his death. Um, uh, there is a very yeah. controversial book that came out I don't know two or three years ago. You know the one I'm talking about that yeah. that. That basically yeah. said that he was he, he was murdered by some boys. Uh, what yeah. what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, it's it's like the thing. But we, we I would like to put it in the category of the new myths. You might say with the old myths about something one painting and, and, and other things that he was always poor. But when that's also not a myth because and um, since he was never really very poor because his brother gave him quite a lot of money in, in the end. When you, when you think of it, he was getting more money than any skilled laborer at the time. Uh, for for makers was, but of course everything went to painting. So in, in a way he was poor in that respect, uh, but he had ample material to to paint. But the, a new one we we tend to think is is indeed is that he was uh, killed by two boys. Um, part of what we did with the the exhibition from on the verge of insanity is was to get a better grip also on his life in the last let's say one and a half year of his life and his psychological problems became so big. It was also to to find, you might say, the path in a way that led to taking, uh, for him to taking his life himself. And when you look at it closely, I mean, uh, when, when the book came out and I read the passage about the, uh, about the two boys, and I knew the information about, about the, 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 the boy secretar, uh, of the, the, the Mr. Secretar, who was supposedly one of them who had done it, and who had given this interview in 56, on which everything was based. But in the interview, it doesn't say anything about, uh, of course, killing Vincent. It was only the fact that Vincent probably had the gun and the revolver. That, uh, well, but realistically, who's going to yeah. admit, if, if they murdered somebody, yeah. who's going to admit that and spend the rest of their life in prison? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, indeed, yeah. No, it's a, it is quite logical. And it, you know, logical is, is, is strange to say, but in, in the way, when you look at Vincent's life, so how, how, how it's going on, and when he goes to Auvers with us, and as I said, but he's making this more than 70 paintings in 70 days, and the, the way that he was in a rush. And there was a big change, you might say, in his, in, in his life because of this, of course, these psychological problems. But at the same time, his brother Theo, uh, who was working for this, well, this big art gallery and, and made quite some money and could, could well, support now a family. He had a little kid. He was married. And, of course, there was Vincent. And in the beginning, the two were alone. They were alone together, you might say. And it was then teaming up. It was a logical thing. And this is how, how they could take well, face life in, in a way. They would always look after themselves. And now there were four of them. And Vincent, is quite clear. and also Theo in the beginning, was like, and also, he said also to, 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 to his wife, he said, I've got a brother, this painter, and we're very close. And in fact, I hope we, the four of us can, can, can be the same group as that two of us were together. 
But of course, having a life of your own with a wife and kid is something different. And that's what Theo learned in his, in his early pension when he, when he was there. And when Vincent came back, came out of saint Remy into, into, uh, to Auvergne-sur-Vaise and to Paris and met uh, his sister-in-law for the first time, and also saw his, his nephew for the first time, he realized also that um, that was the first and the major and the most important concern for his brother. So we went to Auvers Suvaza, and in that period, so the first month, of, well, everything went quite quite well. Uh, he was there was a doctor Cachet who was taking a little bit care of him, but around the beginning of July there were some serious changes, and that was when Vincent went back to Paris to have uh, to talk with him in, 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 well, to visit Fio and, and, and his wife, and there was a big discussion going on because Fio was thinking of starting a, a firm on his own. So get out of the business of the Coupil business in the art gallery and start something of his own. His wife didn't like the idea. Vincent didn't like the idea. But he was not listened to anymore, you might say. And Theo more or less persevered his own opinion, went to his bosses and gave them an ultimatum and said, uh, I mean, I would like to have a raise uh, in, in pay. Otherwise, I will leave, leave, leave the firm. And I give you an ultimatum you can react within you know, 14 days. Now, Vincent went more or less quite emotional uh, back to auvers sur and wrote a letter a couple of days later to them that is, is that, that the moment that he came back is that he went into the fields painting and he made the paintings of the, 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 the wheat fields of crows outstretched very lonely landscapes and he wrote that this, his, of emotion his brush almost fell from his hand and he wanted to put something of this enormous loneliness in these landscapes. So this all tells of these works in a way reflect the psychological situation of the moment. It is quite telling that from that moment on, from the beginning of July, Simpson would always go two or three days to Dr. Cachet, where he would eat a little bit and they would talk, and in this way, he could, his doctor could keep an eye on him a little bit. He didn't go back anymore to Cachet. He, made, uh, he got into, well, not exactly a fight, but they got a dispute and discussion about some quite some silly thing, and he didn't go back there anymore. So for three weeks, he was on his own. He was not going to Cachet. And it's in that period that he, and that's, that's quite typical what we also learned from psychologists and psychiatrists, is that is, and, and people who are, have these specializations in, 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 in people with, with, with suicides, is that people um, become more, more of a recluse, so they retreat into themselves. And it seems that what Vincent was doing that at the time. At, at the same time, Theo didn't say anything about what happened with his bosses, because in the end, he, um, he agreed, and he just simply stayed. He didn't get a raise, and he simply stayed with the Coupil Camry. And Vincent tried, asked Theo a couple of times what happened, but he never got an answer. So he must have thought, this is a probably the vote. He's going his own way. And of course, I mean, he has the right. He has a life of his own. He has a wife to support. And probably then he must have had the sad feeling that, uh, that, that he was perhaps too much. And uh, as many of these people explained is that uh, people who uh, are thinking of, of suicide, and Vincent was thinking about suicide ever since the moment that he, after he kind of cut off his ear and had these psychosis periods for, for several times, suicide is more often on his mind, contrary to what he, what was said in the biography, is that Vincent never talks about suicide. It's not true. It's in the last year and a half, he does talk about suicide and, and in, the, in, in those situations. It's that people almost unconsciously prepare themselves for, for, for doing so. And, and that's in the time that he must have gotten, gotten the revolver, which belonged to the innkeeper in, 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 in Auvergne. And, um, and, well, you can do it or you can't do it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just in that moment that's of despair or whatever that, that he indeed did it. And then afterwards, you might say, so, I mean, it was obviously for everybody. It was Emile Bernard who went to the funeral and who wrote the day after to Albert Royer, the critic, is that, that but, well, you don't have to guess how he died. I mean, he took his own life. It was clear to everybody, and you can tell also by the way, so, so if you mystically, you usually, because you don't talk about it openly, but sometimes in letters you, you read between the lines that it's quite sure for everybody that he simply took his own life. And given all the evidence which was found even later, so even about the revolver that was uh, found, uh, found again, and which we also believe in that it's, very, very, very uh, uh, well possible that it was indeed the revolver that Vincent used was found in the fields in uh, in Auvergne. Points in that direction. What we know about the wound, what we what we know about the scar, that means it fits all quite exceptionally well. You might say that for us there is uh, no share of a doubt that that uh, Vincent uh, took his own life. 
And why do you think his brother died so quickly afterwards? Do you think it was grief driven? You know, oftentimes a spouse will, dr- yeah, will die very fast. Yeah, it's yeah, emotionally I've come part, part about grief, but also because the fear we, we were quite sure that he suffered from the last stages of syphilis, and which he had, must have been contracted already quite some time before. And uh, in fact, Theo's physical and health was uh, much worse than, than, than Vincent over the years. There are lots of complaints in, in the letters, and you read between the lines, of course, in what Vincent writes. This, uh, you usually ask, well, what did the doctor say, and things like that. He had some kinds of hard, simple heart problems. He had some problems with his legs. Uh, also nervous problems, but that had to do with uh, with a syphilis disease. And he really got into just about a month and a half after Vincent died uh, into the serious complication of the last stage of syphilis, where he com- completely mad. And uh, so he was indeed uh, locked away in, a, in an asylum uh, as Vincent was, but he was indeed, uh, nobody could talk to him anymore. He died uh, very soon afterwards, in the beginning of January, 1891. So was he was he locked away? In a, was he in thing. an asylum while Vincent was still alive? Yes, he was. Yeah, so yeah, maybe, was maybe he. So first he, he he saw the end coming. Then yeah, he. Uh, no, well, he, he he started to react very strangely, and so a doctor was called, and he was brought to a, to a small uh, a small asylum in Passy in, in Paris. Uh, but he was under observation, and they even had a psychiatrist from Holland coming over to to, uh, to, to, to research him and inspect him. And he was removed then from Paris uh, to uh, the Netherlands in Utrecht in uh, a clinic there, a private clinic. And he was treated there for the for the last two or three months of his life. So he died. In, I think he stayed there for about two and a half months before he died in January 1891, mm-hmm. and left his very young widow for 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 29 with a little kid. At the moment, who had been married only for two years, which is, in respect, of course, a very, all very, all <laughs> very, very quickly. And what she did, and which is uh, anybody listening, I mean, whenever you go to, to when you, perhaps you go to Paris sometime, and Auvers sur is not very far from Paris, it's just north of Paris, and it's beautiful, still a beautiful little village. You can visit the room where Vincent died, and it's turned into a wonderful place of memory. You might say Vincent it's a little bit. There, but it's a little bit eerie well. to sit in that room. I think. Sorry. It's a little bit yeah, eerie. Yeah, eerie. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. It can get to you when you're there. Yeah, but uh, it, it, it's. I, I like walking around in the places where Vincent walks around, whether it's the south of France, whether it's in the south of the Netherlands. Um, I live in Amsterdam. Vincent lives in Amsterdam for a year, so it's also nice to visit those places. It's, uh, it gives you something an idea of of the circumstances, of of, of perspectives and things. And it's Certainly does. Pretty nice places to 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 think about all kinds of things. But Auvers is not very special because of this this place where he where he died. But also the two graves of, of are there. Of course, Vincent died there, but but few found in the Netherlands. But what his uh, his wife did is that. Uh, she well, Theo had bought a leash on Vincent's grave for 15 years, and she decided in the end, when she was working on the letters for to have them published, is that well, in the end they should be buried together. So when the leash of uh, Vincent's grave perished in, in 1905, she bought a new plot in, in the cemetery of Auvers, a larger plot, and had Vincent reburied there, and, and made the decision that at the moment that the letters were published, so the letters between the two brothers, that Theo would be exhumed and be uh, reburied again next to his brother in Auvers. And there they lie, so against the wall of this beautiful small cemetery just out of, out, outside of the village, in the middle of the wheat fields, which is, if you go there in the summer, it's an incredible, incredible place to, I, to visit. Yeah, I've been there. It's, it's amazing. As a matter of fact, I'm going there uh, yeah. ag- again next week. So ah, are, are, are there any heirs, uh, any remaining heirs? Uh, Theo had a son. Uh, we don't know. If, yeah. We don't know if Vincent fathered any children, do we? No, the problem didn't. No, <laughs> not that we know of yet, at least. But, no, but he didn't. We know, no, he's, he's, we know he spent and, a lot of time with yeah. prostitutes. But, but uh, Theo had yeah. a son. Is <laughs> and so is there a lineage in that yeah. family? Yeah, there is a lineage, absolutely, and there, and, and, there, and it's a, a, a very large lineage. And, and men is, the Fachoff family is still very quite large. And also very active and very connected in, in with this museum, uh, which is very nice. So the the uh, fin, the fin, uh, Theo's son, Vincent, he had uh, four children, the eldest of which was uh, was killed in, in the war, in the Second World War, and the other three all had families. So the family members of those three uh, are well, 
all of them in each line. So there's the two sons, two sons and one, there was one, uh, one girl and one daughter, and they all have lineage and, and all are in some way interested in the museum. They are part of the uh, the Fitzgerald Foundation. And, uh, and, and, and one of the uh, has also the, the chest uh, of, of who he, the, he, he was supposed to call Theo's great grand, great, yeah, great grandfather is working at the museum. And he's also called Vincent Willem van Gogh, because he sounds Willem van Gogh. Huh. And he's a dear colleague, a good colleague of mine in, in that museum. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, so there is, there is still, there's, yeah, it's wonderful. It's still the interest is still there. And 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 we must not forget. And maybe you know, you heard about this, the, the Dutch filmmaker um, Theo van Gogh, who was uh, murdered uh, in a terrorist act in, in, in early 2004, I believe it was, or 2006. And uh, he was he was a member of the family as well. Hmm. Well, so this is this. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, this is this this is it. So it is a, it is a large family, very well connected, and some of them even artists like Theo van Gogh. He was a he was a great filmmaker, uh-huh. and, uh, and 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 the interest is uh, uh, goes from. I mean, there is now a new generation coming up, and there is a younger generation now also going into the Vincent van Gogh Foundation. So there is a a straight continuation, which is wonderful, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to know. Well, th- this has been fascinating. We we uh, we learn more about Van Hoch than I think I've ever known. And you've just really filled <laughs> in all the gaps. I hope so. And, and uh, yeah. Theo, it's, it's been absolutely wonderful. I hope, uh, I hope I, I, that uh, this has been good for you. And I, and I would encourage everybody listening to go, go to the Van Gogh Museum in, uh, in Amsterdam. Yes, please. Everybody's welcome. Yes. Yeah, you're very welcome. And um, I'll be getting people from all over the world. And I must say, that, I mean, I think for a very long time, it's, I think it still is, the our American visitors are the number one from the people coming from abroad. So we think it's the Japanese, but it's not. But it's the Americans who who, who enjoy. I know who enjoy uh, things out very much, and uh, and uh, we like to. I hope to do it. they continue to do so. Of course, it's a it's a very wonderful experience, and I think everybody would would definitely enjoy it. Well, thank you again for being on the Plein Air podcast. Thank you, Eric. Well, thanks again to Theo Mettendorp. I found it fascinating. And I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to say Van Gogh because that hurts my throat. <laughs> but I think you know what I mean when I say Van Gogh or Gogh. Anyway, you ready for some marketing ideas? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions from, well, from your emails. Just email me, eric, at plenairmagazine.com. Plen, P-L-E-I-N, A-I-R, magazine.com. Here's a question from Laura in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, who says, I'm close to the age when most people start thinking of retirement. But what does retirement look like for an artist? Do I have time to build a retirement fund from selling art? Well... Look, Laura, I, I am very much a believer that um, age is a state of mind. Now, obviously, age is a physical thing. But I know people like my dad, you know, 93 years old, working 15-hour days, happy, making money, doing great things, socially active. And I know people in their 50s who can't get out of bed. And, and some of it's physical and some of it's mental. All right, so I can't predict what you personally can do. And of course, I don't give financial advice. I'm not qualified, and I don't know what your needs are. But let's kind of approach this from a generic standpoint. First, I think obviously all of us should be looking to do the best we can to save, put money away, invest some money over time before we get to retirement age because you never know what's going to happen. You never know if you're going to have a health problem and not be able to work. I encounter people all the time about the idea of making a little extra money in what they refer to as retirement. A lot of people who've worked in other jobs, a lot of doctors and psychologists and architects and professionals of all kinds um, who become artists. And a lot of them who are, you know, never had those kind of jobs, but had some kind of job. And so some of them want to do it just because they want to be part of the lifestyle. They want to be part of the shows. Some of them don't need the money. Some of them 
uh, want to just make an extra 500 or 1,000 bucks a month, you know, to supplement their social security or their investments. And some of them, you know, they want to make a full, full out living. So what you got to do is build a plan. You got to figure out what is it that you need? How do you get there? But I, I think, you know, being an artist is a beautiful thing for a retired person. And of course, you can't really look at yourself as retired. If, if, if you're becoming, if you're taking on a job as an artist to make an income, you're not retired. You've just changed jobs, right? Your job is to be an artist who makes money. And if you don't have to be an artist who makes money, if you want to be an artist who doesn't make money, then your job is to be an artist. And then you can be kind of more casual about it. But you've got to be disciplined anytime that you have to make a certain amount of money. You have to follow a discipline, a marketing discipline, a management discipline, and so on. And that's just kind of part of the deal when you're anything you're trying to do to make money. It's just like you've got to manage your money when you have a job, right? So I did a couple of, a couple of years ago, I did a marketing session that was designed for people who want to quit their job and start painting full-time. It was called How to Quit Your dirty, rotten, stinking job and become a full-time successful artist or something like that. Anyway, um, it's, yeah, there's a video floating out there somewhere. I think it's Streamline Art Video. And the concept is that you can do it. It's best to start your art career and gradually ramp up your income before you leave or before you retire. And that way you've ramped up your income before you quit. And that way you've kind of proven that you can do it. Then you don't have to kind of scramble all the time. I think that's a good way to do it. But there's lots of other strategies, too. And the idea is you have to understand that if you're going to sell your work, depending on the level of sales you're looking for, you have to brand yourself, you have to build a reputation, you have to market yourself. Branding is all about building trust and awareness, right? So uh, people will, if, if it's down to two paintings and they're both equally beautiful and they can't decide, they're going to go, they're going to default to the brand. Uh, that's why I was in the shoe store today. And I was kind of down to two pair of shoes I liked. That they liked them both. I didn't need them both. And finally, I said, well, I'm going to take this one because I know the brand a little better. It was actually a little bit more expensive, but I felt more confident with that brand. So that's kind of how it works. I hope this helps. Anyway, uh, nothing good is easy. I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't easy or was easy. But you've just got to, you know, you could take it on. And, you know, you may have different levels of energy than you did when you were 12 or 30. But uh, I have the same energy, quite frankly. And so I'm just crushing it. And you can do it to it. But, you know, you got to work at it. You got to, there's a lot of stuff you have to do physically and mentally and everything else. So anyway, hope this helps you. The next question is from Carolyn in Houston who says, how do I know if I should put my artwork under glass? I'm ready to sell a piece. Does the type of glass matter? Kind of an interesting question, Carolyn. I'm not sure how to answer it exactly, but most artwork that's under glass is art that has a chance of fading or maybe getting damaged, like pastels oftentimes are under glass so that the, the, you know, your hands don't get on them. Of course, you can spray fixatives on them, but uh, watercolors are oftentimes under glass too. So some of the newer watercolor pigments don't fade, but the reason they put them under glass originally is to protect them, but also so that they didn't fade or so that the cleaning lady didn't come along and spray it with some kind of a substance that made it run. That would be a disaster. I've seen it happen. Uh, anyway, the type of glass matters. Most people suggest what they call museum glass. It's more expensive. It's non-glare, and of course it has UV filtering to keep the fading from happening. But, you know, glass complicates everything. Glass complicates shipping. You got to be more careful. You got to pack it better. Um, if you're somebody like me who's out, you're doing shows, you got to carry glass with you, you got frames, and, you know, it's a lot of hassle. So that's why a lot of people paint in other mediums uh, when they're plein air, especially if they're doing shows, just because they don't want to have to carry glass, quite frankly. But that's up to you. Back in the late 1800s, there were, uh, they put oils under glass. As a matter of fact, I have a beautiful old Dutch 19th century painting, maybe 18th century painting in front of me that's framed under glass. The whole frame is under glass and there's a, built, a box built around it. And I asked the art dealer uh, about this and he said, well, they did that because at the time there were a lot of coal stoves, people were smoking cigarettes and cigars, and there were you know, fireplaces and, the, and these things would get covered with soot. 
So all they had to do is clean the glass instead of clean the painting. But as I stare at that painting, I'm seeing reflections of myself and my paperwork in it. It's not as beautiful as it could be because it's not non-glare glass because it's well over 100 years old. But you get the drift anyway. So I think you just kind of decide what you want to put up with and whether it's worth it. You know, a lot of people will put things, hang things with glass in their homes all the time. You know, they have pictures under glass and documents under glass. Glass is very common. I wouldn't worry about that. I hope that answers your question. And I don't think glass is a deterrent. Anyway, that's the Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. Well, a reminder to check out the Van Gogh painting technique video from Dina Peterson. And you can find that. It's a landscape or there's a portrait painting video at lilyartvideo.com. That's for Lil at all, but you can't spell that. So it's lily, L-I-L-I, artvideo.com. Just search Van Gogh or Van Gogh. And you can find out more about the Denver Convention, the Plein Air Convention at pleinairconvention.com. And to learn more about the casting for the TV show, go to The Great Outdoor Painting Challenge. Dot com. A lot of URLs to remember. One more for you. Coffeewitheric.com. That's where you'll find my Sunday coffee. And, of course, you can subscribe. Then you don't have to go to the website. It'll just come to you every week. And, oh, I think I've got another URL for you. Outdoorpainter.com. If you go there, we've got this great ebook, 240 Tips for Plein Air Painters. You can find that at Outdoorpainter.com. Good way to get started. Always fun to do this. I think next time you're going to need a pen to write all this down. We'll put it in the show notes, too. Anyway, let's do it again sometime like next week. I'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, and I'm the publisher and the founder of Plen Air Magazine, which you should subscribe to, of course. And it's a big world out there. We'll see you out there painting. Bye-bye. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about plein air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.